I'm John Forty. Coming up next on the St. Paul Forum, I'll be speaking with David Hodnefield and Jerry Massengill of Historic Information Gatherers. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. With me today are David Hodnefield and Jerry Massengill of Historical Information Gatherers. Welcome, you guys. Hi, John. Good afternoon. We are here to talk in a very professional way, so I'll start wrong. How long have you guys been married? Oops. <laughs> you do have to know the answer to this. Let's see, almost 10 years? Okay. I think it is. And yeah. how long have you been business partners? Which preceded the marriage or the business partner thing? Married first. Okay, all right. Well, on a technical <laughs> level, there was always uh, some collaboration uh, from the very beginning of the company. Okay. So. so tell me, what is Historical Information Gatherers? Well, we're a firm that collects and provides to our clients data that helps them interpret the uses of properties in the past. And most of our clients are looking at this data to try and figure out if the site may have become contaminated due to past site uses. So it's mostly protection. It is. It's a yeah. liability protection issue. Uh, there's uh, regulations that say if you own a property and it's contaminated, then you're responsible for the contamination, whether you caused it or not. So prior to buying commercial property, people do some type of investigation usually. So do you have like a lot of lawyer clients? We have a few. Okay. It's mostly environmental consulting firms. Okay. And they're doing a, what's called a phase one environmental site assessment. Mm -hmm. And we do the historical research that's part of that. Uh, one of the aspects of the phase one assessment is to look at the historical use of the property and uh, typically you're trying to find out who, what businesses were there or what kind of activities went on. So our job is to try and track down whatever evidence we can find about the history of the property and who occupied it, what did they do there, and give that to our clients. And then they can make heads or tails of, of what it means and, and whether it's relevant or not. So do you have your noses buried in the stacks of the library or do you have to go all gumshoe and Columbo and go out and ask questions to people? Things have really changed since the company started almost 16 years ago. It used to be David was running around driving from library to library and making physical hard copies of things and now, at this point, we go get stuff and scan it in electronically and deliver it that way to our clients. There, there used to be so much more running around, I was 20 pounds lighter. Okay. So. <laughs> the sedentary life isn't sitting that well with you. No, okay. no. I, I, right. I, I miss the old days. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so how far back do you go? I mean, you're going back to, like, 1900? Or do, does your work, like, dovetail with Native American legal issues? I wouldn't say it goes back that far, but there are some properties that may have in the past been, you know, occupied or owned by other people, and and now it's part of an Indian reservation. And mm -hmm. if we do some kind of a chain of title research on that, that's very complicated whenever the federal government's involved. But for typical commercial properties um, in urban core areas, we can go back to uh, the mid to late 1800s with some of the sources. There, there are some times where the, the work we do kind of does dovetail with, with some historical uh, work involving Native Americans, um, mostly with cell towers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's concern because uh, at, at one point, one of the cell tower companies was putting up a, a tower in Iowa and they actually put it on an Indian burial ground. And it, it caused quite a stir, quite a ruckus. I think the, the tribe was asking for them to remove it by helicopter, lift it straight up yeah. off the property and, and get it out of there. Um, so some of that work goes on. We don't really do that ourselves. Uh, we're more about tracking down historical aerial photography or, or uh, maps that, that depict the properties uh, or the ownership of the properties. And, and directories that list what businesses were there. 
Or maybe we'll run to City Hall and look at the building permit records, the tax assessor records, things like that. And are you mostly focused literally on the lot or the building? Do you do, you do some of each? Well, the property itself, the land itself, is really the focus of the investigation because if the property is contaminated, it's going to be in the soil or groundwater. Um, that's what the Superfund CERCLA law covers. But in reality, business risk assessment comes into it because if I'm going to buy a building, I also want to know, is there asbestos or lead-based paint or some other potential health hazard to my employees in that building. And I would think that contaminants would also involve things just like uh, drainage, drainage issues. If there's contaminants mm -hmm. right nearby, is that part of the stuff that you're scouting for people? Absolutely. Uh, our environmental consultants are not looking just at the property itself. They have to look at the whole neighborhood. So if you had a dry cleaner next door to your property for several years, chances are there's been a release of those dry cleaning chemicals, mm -hmm. which are very nasty, and they get into the groundwater quite quickly, and it could impact your property. Now, she, go ahead. She, I was just going to say, Jerry's talking a lot like she's still an environmental <laughs> consultant, which she's not, and that's not what our company does anymore. The, the research we do goes to the people who do those sorts of assessments, and that's what they're looking for. But but uh, we're, we are out of the environmental consulting business directly now and, and doing the historical research. Okay, you provide data to them. And so I would think that you guys would have a really good handle on what life was like in 1900 or 1920, you know, when at that time the urban cores had you know, like, what, nine to a house or something like that? Well, you, you can tell from lists of tenants in what we call city directories mm -hmm. who occupied buildings. and. Apartment buildings will be listed, and then the occupants that cared to respond to the request for information or were on the tenant roll will show up. So that's true for residences as well as commercial buildings. Okay. Um, when did the real uh, surge of contaminants begin? I mean, was it like 1900? Was it prior to that? Was it later than that? Well, really, the Industrial Revolution okay. is the beginning. So, like as soon as Caucasians got here, it started. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it, I would say in the early, you know, history of our country, things were a lot less nasty in some cases because just we just didn't have man-made chemicals. You know, mm -hmm. things were more natural processes. But very quickly, things like tanneries and you know, and then later plastics came along, and all those types of man-made composite materials and manufacturing taking off and all those things involve hazardous mm -hmm. chemicals. And, and who are your clients? Our client base is primarily environmental consulting firms and their clients are lending institutions, property buyers, developers who are looking to take a financial interest in a property. So you're kind of upstream from the clients. That sounds like a good place to be. It is. Yeah, I'll get back to you as soon as I talk to Jerry and David. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, how did you get interested in this? I mean, it's such, it's such an interesting topic, mm -hmm. but it's also such a unique niche. I guess that came from me. Okay. And it's kind of funny. I first met Jerry when I interviewed to join her group as the historical researcher. So we were working for an environmental consulting firm. I had been in a different division. Mm -hmm. and. And uh, I came in and interviewed for this position, which I got hired for, uh, and uh, that was the first we met. But I, I started the job and I just loved it because it was all about poking around in libraries mm -hmm. and jumping in the car and drive to, to the local city hall or drive to the university, go here, go there. Uh, they sent me to Kansas City on one of my first projects. Go find information for us and I just love that sort of thing and they promoted me in the company my fault Good move. and I didn't enjoy my job very much <laughs> but I also saw my replacement was missing stuff left and right they were they couldn't do the job and I thought aha here's my chance um, so I started the company with that I idea that I was going to do this historical research and uh, in some ways, I've taken a lot of the fun out of it because it used to be, <laughs> it used to be you get in the car, you drive someplace, you run in, you, you dig through the library, you find what you're looking for, and, and so on. And now we just, we scan the stuff, we bring it back to the office. It's mm -hmm. in the computer, you just call it up on the yeah. screen and look at it, and, 
and off it goes. So, uh, so s some of the romance has disappeared now. Now, do you have big surges in demand for your services? I mean, there was a thing about the arsenic triangle in, in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and is, is that kind of thing? Your phone rings off the hook all of a sudden. You're like emergency people. <laughs> Well, coincidentally, I actually worked for the firm that redeveloped that property at the time. I was working um, for Ryan Companies, mm -hmm. and so I know a little bit about that property. And um, it, they're not necessarily going to call our company, mm -hmm. but when people are invited to the party, as we call it, to help contribute financially to a Superfund cleanup, which that was the case, that's a euphemism for invited to the party. Yes. <laughs> Come write me a check. Exactly. Yeah. The attorneys probably yeah. coined that term. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as soon as you buy a property to redevelop, even though you had nothing to do with the prior, you're invited to the party and, and lawsuits start flying. But you can get out of your liability by performing a regulatory compliant phase one environmental site assessment to say you looked into it, you weren't involved, and you have to do... Um, things continuous there on out to the property to make sure you don't make the contamination worse. So I would think that as people try and leave the party, they would almost be seeking your services dovetailed with like a, a title provenance company to say that, you know, during this bracket, nothing happened and we got nothing to do with it. And maybe the judge says, tough. I suppose it's just hard to say yeah. what happens. Um, we're in the city of St. Paul. You must have some good stories about St. Paul. I think David has an interesting one about the flats area. Well, the the, uh, the river flats, south of the area south of the river there, they used to just drive us up the wall trying to do site-specific research. So our, our client would would send us a site, and and uh, we'd start going backwards looking at old aerial photos, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden between the the 1970 photograph and the 1966 photograph, all the streets and all the buildings change. At least, uh, you know, the vast majority, 90% mm -hmm. of them, they all, they all change. And you'd say, okay, I know my site's here somewhere, but, but where is it? And you'd have to spend a lot of time trying to find where the site, where the site was on the map because everything had changed so, so utterly. Um, and the streets had even changed locations, and that's what we're, so it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's where I first really learned that 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 part of the city had been totally redeveloped uh, after the flood uh, was was during that. But uh, since that time, we've made life much easier, and and that is we do what's called geo referencing of the images. So we use a, a geographic information software, or GIS. And we take that image and we'll, we'll pick some points on the map mm -hmm. and line them up with a map in the computer, and it will then place that map there. So then if I have a, a, a site down in that area, um, there's also uh, an area up by 35E and, and Minnehaha that's, that's a troublesome area as well. Mm -hmm. um, now you can find the, the exact location. So if you just imagine Google Maps, but but uh, you're looking at old maps instead of current maps, yeah. so you can see where this, how the street has moved, or 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 how the building has changed, been replaced. Has Google Earth affected your work? It has. There's more aerial photographs that are now available online, but you know the best ones are more recent, and our clients are concerned with the past. Yeah. And there's a lot less of those available. Just depends you know, where you are and where your site is located. But, you know, well, even if, if there is an aerial available online, it might not be the right resolution. It might, your site won't necessarily be centered and it's not ready for placement in a report. And we do all those things. Okay. The, the one thing I would say about Google, it, uh, I find it to be an improvement because since it became well used, our clients can send us a map showing where their site is. And so they're very familiar with looking at aerial photographs and maps in the Google interface, and uh, it's a lot easier for them to get us something. You know, one other interesting story in, in St. Paul, uh, there was a, a, a building we had worked on for a client of ours who was an environmental consultant. And they had a, a building that they owned, and they moved into a new building and, and put that one up for sale. And, you know, presumably they would have done 
this phase one assessment and, and they'd be aware of any potential problems with their building. So they put it up for sale and a competitor of theirs hired us and, and said, you know, we're ordering the works from you guys. Give us all the historical you can dig up. And, you know, we went through source after source after source and saw nothing of interest, nothing of interest. And finally, we came across the tax assessor records and found that a 20,000 gallon underground storage tank used for fuel oil had been put in place in 1952. And uh, it ended up costing uh, that the, the company that was selling the building a, a bunch of money in the deal, as, as well as a little bit of, of their pride, perhaps. Okay. Um, tell me about your sources. You have a, a number of sources you can draw on. Well, the actual data sources that we typically are looking at are aerial photographs, topographic maps, fire insurance maps, real estate atlases, and city directories. And city directories, I should explain, are a lot like phone books in size and thickness and what they contain, but they will list streets alphabetically, numerically and then alphabetically, so you can look up an address back and go back in time and see who used to occupy that particular property and who the neighbors were too. So that's a great source, especially in urban areas where city directories were published. And how much of your work is really focused on, on urban cores or industrial corridors? I, well, most of our work is going to be in an urban or developed area, but some of our large projects area-wise are going to be in much more rural areas. Like we've done huge property swaths for wind farms or mining interests or what we call a corridor project, a new pipeline's going in, or a road is being redeveloped, or a bridge is being rebuilt. Or one and, of my favorites, uh, we did a project that ultimately went to the Army Corps of Engineers looking at what happens if the lake levels in Devil's Lake, North Dakota rise another 12 inches or 18 inches. You know, just what area is going to be flooded out by that and, and what impacts are there, are there going to be? Um, and, and we gathered up the historical data and that was, uh, that was quite a project for us at the time because we didn't know how to handle such large areas when, for instance, the, the aerial photographs that we're looking at um, only cover a small part of it. Mm -hmm. So we need aerial photography for this area that's say 300 square miles in size um, and it's going to take 150 photos per year. So how do you, how do you make that manageable? And, uh, that was and an you figured project. it out. Yeah. 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 We figured it out, yeah. Taping together a lot of photographs? Or <laughs> Electronically yeah. taping yeah. them yeah. together yeah. is kind of what and, we do. Have yeah. you these photographs from Mark Hurd aerial surveys? Are you guys familiar with them? Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're, they're no longer, they're, Mark Hurd, their aerometric. Okay. Uh, Mark Hurd was the whoever the guy who started the company mm -hmm. in the in this area, in the 1920s, I think, or 30s at the latest. Um, and uh, they they're still around, aerometric. Uh, and we we go to them once in a while. They've got some good stuff, but mostly we work with with documents that are readily available from federal agencies or state agencies, and. Uh, of course, Mark Hurd does some of their work. Yeah, or but they're proprietary and they're more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the first job I had out of high school was a courier for Mark Hurd Aerial Surveys. Oh. And about 10 years later, I read that if you want to know the geopolitical hotspots, uh, look at what Mark Hurd's doing, because apparently the CIA is one of their big contractors. And, but like, they were the ones that actually tracked down Che Guevara. They, you know, they've taken just photographs. And there's a lot of a lot of bodies there. That's probably where. Which good, is, to, good to know. It's yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Who, who am I really dealing with here? <laughs> I wasn't aware of that end of their business. I just knew they did mapping photography yeah. for cities and yeah. counties. And well, yeah. thanks for and, the uh, tip. Yeah. New clients. Well, you, you grew up in the West suburbs, right? A uh, northern, actually. Okay. Yeah. Because I grew up in the West suburbs, and just yeah. in my lifetime, how much it has changed. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I would love to get my hands on aerial photographs of the 30s and 20s. And when did the roads go in? When did, when was Highway 55 a four lane? Right. And all that kind of stuff is just so interesting. Yeah. And do you have any dealings with that kind of stuff? Sure. Uh, we have, you know, just regular people off the street that aren't doing any kind of work for clients that want to know. What happened to my property and that's the typical thing they'll order is aerial photographs just to get a history of the development on the property how the house changed or sometimes it's because they'll say something like my neighbor put um, his fence on my property and i'm going to get aerial photographs to prove 
you know, where yeah. things used to be. Yeah. Um, is there like a baseline of, of the law when the Homesteading Act, when people were allowed to what, claim 160 acres? I mean, was downtown Minneapolis really somebody's farm to start with? <laughs> <laughs> and they just subbed it out, subbed it out in little niches? Well, I think uh, maybe the other side of the river from downtown yeah. was the Indian hangout. <laughs> we know that, the Indian camp there. The, the, and, yeah. the Homestead Act was, it was like the 1860s, something, something like, that. like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was, was, it, was it 40 acres? And I, mean, I don't remember how it worked, but yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if we go back that far in time, uh, the, really the only source to go back that far in time is a, a chain of title, an mm -hmm. ownership chain of title. Well, uh, yeah, but you won't, you won't catch on to some of that before the U.S. had. Didn't, uh, I just have a vague recollection of this, but I, I thought Minneapolis was kept on the one side of the river and then they had like one day where now you can go across and claim some land. And of course some guy, a famous uh, Minneapolitan, uh, swam the river the night before <laughs> and cheated. He was, he was a sooner. <laughs> yes. yes so, exactly. Like yeah, yeah, same yeah. exact thing. Yeah. I, I thought that's what happened, but... Uh, <laughs> And is, now, how much of your business is is local, or how? I mean, it sounds like you've got such a unique niche that you could actually be doing this all over the country. And we are yeah. now. It started out very locally. Um, with David started the company about 16 years ago, and he would go from consulting firm to engineering firm throughout the Twin Cities and get their business, and that's how we got started. And we've really grown geographically since and mm -hmm. right now we've got mm -hmm. clients from all across the country and we do sites all across the country too. Okay. Whereas I like to say I, I have library cards all the way from the University of Anchorage to the Library of Congress. Wow, that's so. quite a span. Um, why don't you tell us about your website? If, if there's anybody that could use your services, mm -hmm. the website is what? It's www.historicalinfo.com. Okay. And are you basically seeking clients through that, or is there a public service or promotion dimension, or what goes on on the website? Well, I think it would be interesting for people just to see some of the examples we have up there. Our homepage actually shows some of the data sources that we look at for one particular property. Um, shows a fire insurance map, an aerial photograph, and some things to give you an idea of kind of the sources that you would look at to see the properties. And then there's all kinds of information about our different products and services. And, and things are going great guns for you. It's good. Yeah, you're, you're a competitive business with no competitors, so you've got lots of proprietary strategies. Are you willing to talk about them here on television? We have competitors. <laughs> okay. We do have yeah. competitors. We are the, the little regional guy in the big national uh, pool, but we are av really gaining clients constantly because of uh, the quality of what we do, really. Okay. And what's going to happen in the future for this line of work? It's, you, as long as there's a liability tail, there'll be work for you. Absolutely. And, but yeah. is there dimensions that could expand it? Will global warming have any aspect on your work? Absolutely. As sea levels rise and other climate change takes effect, um, people are uh, spending a lot of time studying how things have changed over the past 50, 60, 70 years and trying to project into the future, those types of things. And the lake example that you gave is one. You know, if the lake level rises for whatever reason, that's an example of, you know. Devil's Lake is such a fascinating case because it, it's so uh, saline that you can't really grow downstream from it, and it flows into Canada. <laughs> there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. So it's really, you know, it's just a nightmare legally. I mean, there's, you know, yes. there's sovereignty issues and there's provenance issues, and it just, um, but what can you do about it? Other than, you know, you're incredibly valued to be able to predict what might happen. But then it's up to others to fight it out, I guess, is that what the, what Let the, the lawyers take are. over, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about the more rural areas, like farms and stuff like that? Do you, have, do you have stuff to do with them? Absolutely. I mean, a lot of cell tower sites are going out in rural areas right now, so that can be a big piece of our business. And the historical sources in rural areas are more limited. So you might not have city directories for a rural area, but you're definitely going to have topographic maps and aerial photographs. and. That's what you look at then. We, uh, the rural areas, we, we have uh, a lot fewer projects, but they do tend to be larger. Um, usually, it's a, well, the cell, cell towers are small, but they come in, in batches. Mm -hmm. um, wind farms has been really big for the last three, four years. 
uh, all, all across the country. Um, but you know, a, a, if a pipeline goes in, if, if MnDOT wants to do a bypass around the town, uh, uh, other, those are the types of projects that we usually get. Occasionally there'll be a, a, a commercial, you know, a quarry or, or a, a grain elevator or something that's rural, but, but uh, and we'll be assessing that. But most of the time it's, it's other kinds of projects, more infrastructure projects, I guess you'd call it. And just transactions. Now, as you mentioned, grain elevators. You know, occasionally those are demolished. Did people ever seek your services pre-demolition? Sure. Well, usually, if you're going to demolish a building, it's because someone else has bought the property and they mm -hmm. want to redevelop it. Yeah. So where we would come in is prior to that purchase closing, and it mm -hmm. could be even two years before they close on the property because some of these deals take a long time. Yeah. So how thick the gloves have to be when you carry away the rubble. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think we've done, we've done two that have been demolished lately. The one along Hiawatha and, and the one on uh, mm -hmm. the one where the uh, Gopher Stadium is. Yep. Um, we got about 30 seconds left. Anything else you guys want to add? Because this has really been it. You do such fascinating work. Well, it is a, a real niche, like you said. And so a lot of people aren't aware that it's even out there. Um, but you know, other clients of ours are. We do have attorneys for clients, and um, government agencies. Interestingly enough, will hire us, and we end up using photographs from another governmental agency. But we're, it's the processing and all the time involved in that that happens. But yeah, it's fun. We get to go all over the place and meet all kinds of people. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and best of luck to you. Thank you, John. All right. thank I've been you. speaking to David Hodnefield and. Jerry Massengill of Historical Information Gatherers. This is the St. Paul Forum. Come join us again next week.